Hello, uh, my name is Jianning Ma. I am a junior studying anthropology and art history at Wellesley College. I am the Davis Museum Public Programs and Event Assistant. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Davis Museum's webinar by scholar Dr. Jill Burke, which is in conjunction with the exhibition Rory McEwen, uh, A New Perspective on Nature, which is on view at the Davis through December 15th. We will begin with a native land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the Davis Museum at Wellesley College is built on ancestral and traditional land of the Massachusetts people. We also recognize that the United States removal, termination, and assimilation policies and practices resulted in the forced settlement of indigenous lands and the attempted erasure of indigenous cultures and languages. We further acknowledge the oppression, the, the oppression injustices and discrimination that indigenous people have endured and that there is much work to be done on the important journey to reconciliation. We commit to strengthen our understanding of the history and contemporary lives of indigenous peoples and to steward this land. We further recognize the many indigenous people living here today, including the Massachusetts, Wampanoag, and Nipmuc nations who have rich ancestral histories in Wellesley and its surrounding communities. Today, their descendants remind us that they are still here, where they maintain a vital and visible presence. We honor and respect the enduring relationship between these people and this land, as well as the strengths of indigenous culture and knowledge, the continued existence of tribal sovereignty and the principle of tribal self-determination. So to participate in this program, please note that this event is being recorded and will be made available online in the coming days. We are using a webinar format and you and your microphone and video have been turned off during the presentation. Throughout the event, um, you can use a Q&A box to enter your questions um, and live captioning is provided through our Zoom webinar. You can turn it on and off with the closed captions button in the features bar, which is located at the bottom of the screen. Oops, sorry. Um, now I am pleased to welcome Dr. Amanda Gilvin, Interim Co-Director, Sonia Novak Corner 51, Senior Curator of Collections and Associate Directors of Curatorial Affairs. Thank you, Juning. Uh, Juning Mao, class of 26, uh, for uh, kicking us off today. Um, we can uh, take down the slide if you like. Uh, thank you also, Juning, for your help in planning this event. Uh, and I'm always grateful to Davis Media Specialist, Rena Conreddy, for her work. She has led the technological organization of the webinar. And special thanks to Professor of Art, Jacqueline Musacchio, for suggesting this event and introducing us to Dr. Jill Burke. We look forward to seeing all of you who are here virtually today in the Davis Galleries this fall. As always, there's a lot to see in the long-term galleries, and we know many of you have already spent time gazing at the images of plant life in Rory McEwen, A New Perspective on Nature, which presents the vibrant career of the renowned Scottish artist Rory McEwen. In his paintings, he's forged his own personal interpretation of 20th century modernism, portraying individual flowers, leaves, and vegetables as subject matter. This quote, a way of getting as close as possible to what I perceive as the truth, my truth of the time in which I live. Uh, and we at the Davis hope you will learn more about your own truths and your own relationships with plants in this exhibition. Uh, the exhibition and its associated programs are generously supported by the Mildred Cooper Glimpshire 61 Endowed Fund, the Davis World Cultures Fund, the Davis Museum Endowed Fund for International Cultural Programs, and Wellesley College Friends of Art at the Davis. Uh, curated by Ruth Stiff, uh, the Curator of International Exhibitions for uh, Royal Botanic Gardens Q. Uh, the exhibition Rory McEwen, A New Perspective on Nature, is presented by the Davis Museum at Wellesley College in association with Royal Botanic Gardens, Q, and the Oak Spring of a Garden Foundation. And the tour management is by Landau Traveling Exhibitions in Los Angeles, California. The Gerard B. Lambert Foundation has provided major support for the exhibition. 
Uh, and uh, the Davis presentation and related programs um, are also supported by the Wellesley College Friends of Art at the Davis, the Alice G. Spink Art Fund, the Constance Ryan Roby 81 Fund for Museum Exhibitions, and the Catherine Wasserman Davis 28 Fund for World Cultures. I'm now delighted to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Jill Burke is a historian and author of How to Be a Renaissance Woman, the Untold History of Beauty and Female Creativity, uh, which uh, the US edition came out with Pegasus Books uh, this year, 2024. It's her third book uh, and is a New York Times book editor's pick and a BBC Radio 4 book of the week. It's translated into Spanish, Polish, Japanese, and simplified Chinese, and recorded as an audiobook. She's professor of Renaissance visual and material cultures at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. And she's also taught at the Courthold Institute, Kent University and the Open University, in addition to a postdoctoral fellowship at the Harvard Center for Italian Renaissance Studies in Florence. She's interested in how human bodies and the ways individuals think about, represent and modify their own and others' bodies are affected by large scale historical change. We're so excited to learn from you today, Dr. Burke. Welcome. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and thank you to uh, Daphne Mazzacchio for um, initiating this event. I know that some of your students are here and I'm so delighted um, to, um, to hear that some students are here as well. Um, thank you so much to Jeannie and um, on to Amanda for everyone at the Davis for organising this so brilliantly. It's an absolute joy uh, to be able to speak to you from Scotland. Um, um, on this rather rather cold evening in autumn um, about uh, a little touch of summer uh, about um, flowers um, and plants and um, the women in the Renaissance who made use of them in various ways. I'm just going to share my slides now, so do forgive me if this takes a second. Okay, hopefully you'll have my slide up and someone will tell me if that's not the case. Um, so I'm just going to dive straight in. Giovanna Gazzoni's flowers teem with life. In this glass vase, packed densely with spring blooms, they almost seem to fight for supremacy. Some of the assembled tulips droop, their lowered heads almost tumbling from the vase as if in defeat. The yellow anemone risks being crushed at the centre. The victorious striped tulip rises triumphant from the mob, just pipping the papery stemmed nar narcissus at the post. All flower arrangements are testaments to the bounty of nature and the beauty of human artifice, skillfully bringing together a bunch of diverse plants and placing them in a pleasing arrangement. Here, Gaxoni seems also to revel in the unevenly cut stems revealed by the glass vase, the reminder of rather careless work, perhaps by human hands, which are normally hidden from the observer. Carefully reflected window visible on a curved glass surface suggests a room, a strange ju juxtaposition with the rugged earth beneath the vase. A constant reminder in this painting and several variations of this work that perhaps only did at the, in around uh, 1647, of a close interaction between art and nature. Perhaps only complex arrangements of flowers reflect a wider passion for ornate and spectacular floral decoration, um, which placed flowers in fancy towers and cathedrals spread across Europe in the 17th century. And here I'm showing you an image from an important book about flower growing and arranging from 1638, so roughly contemporary to Gazzoni's painting. Neither bringing pot flowers into the home nor painting this bounteous gift of nature was new, of course. There was a long tradition of using vases of flowers on portraits or religious paintings from at least the late 15th century and very likely before this. And I'm really indulging myself by showing you two very beautiful, I think, images of flowers. 
the lilies um, and irises in a jug by Hans Memling, which are on the river of a portrait of a man, um, now in the Thyssen Bornemisza Museum in Madrid. And the flowers stand on the front center of Hugo van der Goes's Portinari altarpiece of about a decade previously. Although this type of decoration featured in church and domestic interiors, as his paintings show, the independent still life painting didn't come into existence until later. And it's often said, probably in a little bit of an oversimplistic way, it's often said Caravaggio's basket of fruit is the prototype, at least in Italy, for thousands of subsequent works in the genre. It's true, it's an un almost unbearably starkly mimetic image, carefully rendering each spot of fungus, each gnarled leaf, each insect nibbled fruit in a way that seems both emblematic and individualized. We can almost see the fruit age from delicious to overripe to inedible as we look. Likely, Caravaggio was influenced, in fact, by the work of the Tuscan painter Jacopo Ligozzi, who had made watercolors of the natural history collections in the Medici Grand Duke's gardens in Florence in the 1580s. Here's yet another, I think, spectacular image showing some exotic birds from the Medici Menagerie on a fig branch. Gazzoni, who had a long relationship with the Medici family, was certainly influenced by Lugozzi too in her careful rendering of the fruit and the flowers she saw. Um, and I'll give you an example of uh, one of her, I think, entrancing fig paintings here. Um, but unlike Lugozzi's forensic specimens, even against the blank backgrounds, her figs cast shadows, live in space and time, rather like Caravaggio's important prototypes. And this is just another comparison between Caravaggio's basket of fruit and Gazzoni's bowl of citrons now at the um, John Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, where you can see this alluringly chipped bowl, the leaves in various state of, um, uh, of curledness, um, as again, these plants these lemons, these citrons, these citrus fruit live in real time. The point I'm getting at, I suppose, here, and this will be threaded throughout the talk, a close interaction between observation and art, sight and science, artifice, artifice and nature, and indeed humans and plants. Gazzoni was one of the most accomplished and knowledgeable botanical painters of, of 17th century Italy, male or female. Her work was recently highlighted in an astonishingly wonderful exhibition in the Uffizi Gallery in 2020. I say astonishingly wonderful because I've seen the catalogue, but unfortunately because of uh, uh, lockdown, um, I wasn't able to get to Florence in that time. The catalogue, however, is wonderful and is still available. It's uh, edited by Sheila Barker, who's done a lot of very important work on Gazzoni and other female artists. Born in 1600 in the small town of Piceno near Rome, Gazzoni spent some of her formative years in Venice, where she showed a precocious skill in penmanship, in music, and in painting. Her early work, like this uh, self-portrait, which she painted at the age of about 18 or 19, um, thrums with ambition. Here she is around the age of 18 or 19, the head of a stringed instrument, probably a viola da gamba, resting against the edge of the pitcher plane. She shows herself draped in a blue classifying robe, slightly reminiscent of ancient Rome, her hair crowned with a circlet of bay laurel, suggesting that she's presenting herself here in the guise of Apollo, the Olympian god associated with artistic, musical and poetic imagination, among other things. Quite a Quite a claim for a girl um, still in her teens. The carelessly cut strings of the viol perhaps question or even gently poke fun at the sitter's claims to godlike perfection, one even winding round the tuning pegs like a vine. It's no accident that that Sony minutely signs her name near one of these dangling strings. And here uh, is a close up. It may be that she painted this image in response to that of uh, a woman who was later to be her friend, Artemisia Gentileschi. She may have seen this portrait whilst um, visiting the Medici court at some point between 16, 18 and 21. 
play comparing these two images, we are dealing with vastly distinct visual sensibilities here, both of which, it has to be said, were equally prized in uh, Medici and Florence. And Gazzoni was in fact acknowledged to be something of, of a prodigy, marvelously gifted in painting, music, and penmanship from an early age. Um, one of the reasons that there are so many successful female painters, relatively many fe successful female painters at this time, is because they were patronized, actively patronized um, by um, the Medici family, amongst others. Painted in her distinctive, painstaking, stippling style, as we have seen, that Sony's grand ambitions didn't hamper her attention to small, telling details. She seems to have carefully put dried bay leaves in her wreath, kind you might use in cooking, as opposed to the bright green leaves of the living plant, perhaps a nod to the way that she's dressing up in this image. She's putting on the costume of Polo. I'm showing you alongside Gatsoni's self-portrait some bay leaves that are almost 500 years old. They're in the still existing collection of uh, Ulisse Aldrovandi, one of several extant herba herbaria, that is collections of dried plants, that give us a glimpse into an otherwise irrevocably lost natural world. As this perhaps indicates, that Sony's interest in plants was the tip of a cultural iceberg. In fact, it's fair to say the obsession with plants spread through Italy in the 16th and 17th century and uh, also through much of the rest of Europe. These were the years when the modern discipline of natural history was formed, with the first chair in medical materials, mainly plants, so equivalent to a chair in botany, established at the University of Padua in 1533 and in Bologna the next year. The establishment of the first botanic garden was in Pisa in 1544, and the year after, a similar garden was made in Padua. And this one still exists in more or less its original startling circular plan. So I'm showing you uh, to the left, a uh, recent photograph of botanic gardens in Padua, and to the right, um, a plan made in 1591 from uh, Giacomo Antonio Cortuzzi's um, description of the gardens, which are rather comforting um, to any um, aspiring gardeners nowadays because he explains that he hasn't actually managed to finish everything he wanted to finish uh, before he published the book. Um, so it's very relatable. Um, these gardens, called Giardino de Semplici, literally gardens of simples, primarily existed to bring together plants deemed useful as medical materials, or that might be useful as medical materials very broadly um, broad, broadly defined. The term simple, which has now fallen out of use, means individual plant, animal, or mineral ingredients were used in medicines. And so you have simple medicines, which involve one of these ingredients, um, perhaps like um, rose water, for example, um, or compound medicines, which bring together various ingredients through more complex procedures. The primary functions of these gardens were for the use of those investigating the properties of plants and other natural materials to treat human ailments. So, as you can see from the designs here, they were also visually impressive. The uh, geometry speaking to the belief in a divinely ordained natural order where God placed powers of healing in nature for humans to discover. These gardens acted like a kind of living encyclopedia or growing library where every possible known plant might be studied. The dried plant collections I mentioned earlier were the equivalent to these botanic gardens. Here, there's some, um, some more sheets from Ulisse Aldrovandi's herbaria, of which around 4,800 specimens survive. And I have to say that these herbaria seem incredible that these um, very delicate materials would survive for 500 years. There's several of them in collections in Italy, and they are really fascinating direct links with um, a, a, a lost past. I picked out um, pages with damask rose, with musk mallow, with wild fig, um, of some of the plants that will go into the cosmetic and hygiene recipes I'm going to talk about later. I think it's amazing um, to understand all of these were growing at some point in Italy between 1550 and 1586, and that you can still see them today. 
I, I should say that I put I put quite a lot of details on the slide in case it's interesting. People want to follow these things up. Um, so you can actually there's a great website where you can look through um, uh, these each each image and these books and that's the um, URL there. Gardens and herbaria have their printed equivalent in the many illustrated herbals um, that um, were published in the 16th and 17th centuries. The most famous and extensively used of these was by the Sienese physician Pietro Andrea Mattioli, who compiled an absolutely massive commentary on an ancient and perennially popular text of medical materials, um, Dioscorides de Materia Medica. Mattioli's text was published first in Latin in 1554 and translated into several European languages, firstly, Italian, not surprising. Um, lavishly illustrated, really there's a there's an illustration of every single plant or, or mainly, mainly plants, but all medical materials discussed practically. It became a standard text for apothecaries and plant hunters all over Europe and medics too. Uh, the colouring of its plates in many versions may have aided recognition of plants by readers, but really I think aimed to enhance the book's aesthetic appeal to an amateur audience. Because it wasn't only professors, wasn't only botanists, and it's not only medics who were fascinated by plants. The interest in gardens, gardening, and foraging for plants was widespread. And if you've been to some of the cities like Venice or Florence, it might not be obvious how many gardens there actually are in these cities, um, because they're, you, you, you're kind of struck by these imposing Renaissance facades. Um, but actually, these hide the fact these cities were dotted with green spaces. And, and J.D. Cranston's recent study of Venice has um, really revealed the importance of these green spaces for the way that um, people thought at this time in the 16th century. They were absolutely full of gardens, used both for pleasure and for medicine and food. And I'm not just talking about these large scale, stately, and elegant garden, gardens like the Palazzo Giusti, uh, near Verona, which I'll talk about in more detail um, later, just because I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm using it as a kind of illustrative, uh, a nice um, way to illustrate Renaissance gardens. Um, but I'm not just talking about these. I'm really talking about more humble affairs um, that really don't exist today, um, which could consist of a patch of ground, um, a square inside, um, generally inside the walls of a house. Um, and places between houses. Every apothecary in the city, for example, and Venice had around 80 apothecary shops for much of the 16th century, ideally had an outside space. Prospero Borgarucci, writing in his 1567 advice book uh, for apothecaries, explained, he must have a kitchen garden or some terrace based alongside the house, not only for the growing of rare medicinal plants, cultivate and preserve them, but also to dry simples more conveniently. Middle and upper class urban dwellers, more expensive gardens. A really nice example, and this is from Josie Cranston's uh, book, is the garden of the Trevisan family on the Giudecca in Venice, shown here in a map of the city, so this is it, um, by Jacopo de Barbary, which was first published in 1500. Um, collection of, um, of building and grounds contains many of the features that are common in 16th and 17th century gardens. So you have an arched portico, portico um, um, going onto a courtyard, um, paved, in, in, so that there's a lower central area for water collection, and, and in this case there's a well in the middle, and next door there's a well in the middle too. Then the garden is divided from the house, um, by a wooden or metal lattice. So there's privacy, but you can see through uh, into the um, green space. And there's a pergola in the center with shaded walks, framed often with scented climbing plants, such as jasmine, with planting beds on either side. You can see a pergola from this period in one of the first the first um, printed book uh, of gardening advice from 1495, Piero Crescenzi's um, On Agriculture, a book that's actually written in the early 14th century, but it's printed 
uh, in the 1490s. And here in this image, you can see a pergola and uh, a young woman looking rather forlorn, being serenaded, probably in a way she's not particularly happy about, by a man here. Um, and here you can see the beds of um, plants that would have been and a, and a cheeky rabbit eating them here. Um, so, and, and pots of flowers as well. And, and this is um, uh, a pergola from the um, um, Justy Garden, just to show you the kind of thing that uh, the kind of thing that I'm talking about here. These urban gardens were both in theory and in practice places where wide-ranging philosophical discussions could take place where groups could come together, eat outside, relax, and enjoy some respite from the busy, from busy city life. These gardens tended to be walled, and unlike the manic manicured lawns of the front yard of modern houses, were hidden from prying eyes. Luckily, there are several literary descriptions as gardens were a favorite imaginary and actual setting for telling tales and having in-depth conversations away from the normal hustle and bustle of the city's piazzas and streets. Moderata Fonte's important text, The Worth of Women, and, and here it is uh, in, in um, the first Italian version in 1600, actually written in the 1590s. Um, so The Worth of Women, which is subtitled, where we clearly reveal how much more worthy and more perfect women are than men. And it's really worth reading the um, English translation or the original Italian, if you can, of this text. It's very funny and um, it's very surprising and a very important text in the history of feminism. Anyway, she records an imagined conversation between a group of female friends sitting in a Venetian garden in the early 1590s. And I'm just going to read her description of the garden so you can have a sense of um, why this kind of being surrounded by plants and, and having these spaces may have been so important, particularly for um, aristocratic women who often weren't, who weren't allowed out and about in the streets outside uh, without chaperones. Fonte writes, realizing that the sun had retreated behind some little clouds, all the friends agreed to go down and enjoy the lovely garden for a while. And I'm just, again, showing you pictures of the Justy Garden so you can help to help you set the scene. And so they set off gaily, taking each other by the hand, going down the stairs. When they got to the garden, words could not express how utterly charming and delightful they found it. For there were rows of little emerald green espaliered shrubs in all kinds of different shapes, some in the form of pyramids, others mushroom-shaped or melon-shaped, or some other shape alternating with carefully pruned and beautifully, beautifully intermingled laurels. Chestnuts, box trees and pomegranates, all cut to precisely the same height without a leaf out of place. Though the loveliest orange trees and lemon trees to be seen with such sweet smelling flowers and fruits that they gladdened the heart with their scent as much as they delighted the eyes. I shall not attempt to list the countless lovely and varied carved urns filled with citrus trees and the daintiest flowers of all kinds nor the quantities of slender myrtles and the fresh lawns of tiny herbs cut into triangles, ovals, squares, and other charming conceits. There were jasmine arbors, labyrinths of bright ivy, and little groves of shaped box trees that would have astounded any connoisseur. And the fruit, I shall not attempt to describe it, for there were vast quantities of fruits of all kinds according to the season, and the useful plants mingled charmingly with the purely decorative made it such a lovely sight that the women could not rest from exploring. As well as enjoying the beauty of the plants, these women had an impressive knowledge of their medicinal properties. Whilst jokingly attempting to find a herbal remedy to cure men of their multifarious defects, discussed in a lot of detail by the characters, Fonte's friends discussed the great powers designed in plants and exchanged knowledge about all manner of natural ingredients. From tree sap, such as balsam, which apparently keeps the face looking fresh and young, and myrrh, good for chest complaints, the plants like rhubarb, which acts against cholera, spices like nutmeg, an aid to digestion for a delicate stomach, and fruits like quinces, plums, and grapes, a little humid and tend to cause wind. Rosemary is celebrated as a cure-all, whilst violets and roses are praised for their sweet smell and soothing and hydrating properties, amongst other flowers like narcissus, hyacinth, jasmine, and tarnation. 
Although this discussion is fictional, it has to reflect the kinds of conversations that many women were having in real life and suggest a close understanding of how the natural world provided ingredients to be processed in various ways to aid human health and appearance. Our assumption that women may know about plants for cookery, as here in uh, Parisian female painters, Louise Louis Moyon's fruit and vegetable cellar, should be extended to their knowledge of the use of plants for medicines. Indeed, in study after study, historians have demonstrated women's practical experience remains central to healthcare in early modern Europe. In an era where most ailments were treated with household remedies, it was often women who were largely charged with making sure their household stayed healthy. Women, moreover, were midwives, healers, and nurses, or worked as barber surgeons conducting minor surgery. They worked as well in pharmacies, sometimes as part here um, as a family team, and this is a um, frontispiece of a German herbal from 1550, uh, where we see um, one woman on the left-hand side um, preparing plants, a uh, woman on the right, um, pouring um, distilled waters into vessels, and the man in the middle um, in the act of distilling these plants um, into, into medicinal and cosmetic waters. Um, sometimes women um, ran uh, apothecaries in their own right. So five of the 85 apothecaries in Venice in 1569 were women. Uh, in Florence at the turn of the 17th century, there are 23 women enrolled in the Guild of Physicians and Apothecaries. To know about medicine and healthcare at both the domestic and a professional level in this period, you needed to know about plants. And I'm showing you here two further glimpses into women's relationship with plants from a herbal illustrated by, by Gerardo Chibo in the late 16th century. This is a very beautiful book and it's available um, online by the British Library website. In, in this image, we see aloe vera, um, which is will, was and is still used in a range of topical. Um, uh, skin care applications. Um, and here we glimpse women tending to the potted plants, which are rather precariously balanced on the edge of their terrace. In the second image, we see, which I think is just absolutely lovely, in the second image, we see women picking and looking through fumitory, um, a plant that was used extensively for skin problems like eczema and psoriasis, and also in a range of what we might now call cosmetic skin care treatments. One previously almost completely overlooked constituency, the vast knowledge of plants and medicines were non-apothecaries. Sharon Strockier's exemplary work on non-apothecaries in later Renaissance Florence has revealed the breadth and depth of knowledge these women possessed, often alongside considerable impressive business acumen. Strachia has mapped convent apothecaries in 16th century Florence and has shown how many of them profited from gardening as well as their skills in herbal medicine. The nuns at San Domenico, for example, which is number three on this plan, I'll just, about, I'll just show you uh, a detail of, the, uh, of this um, map, uh, Stefano Bonsignori map of Florence. Um, the nuns at San, San Domenico, for example, exploited new gardening techniques to, to increase sales. They incorporated new hydraulic apparatus for the ease of watering their extensive range of plants and containers. You can see they have massive uh, gardens here. They also worked out how to keep tender plants safe in the frosty Tuscan winters, um, such as varieties of, of sweet orange, which were imported from Spain, and reputedly made considerable income by developing forcing techniques. If you're a gardener, you'll know what forcing is, um, but I'll explain it, so that plants could flower out of season. It's basically forcing is making plants flower when, when they don't want to flower, um, when they would naturally flower by doing things like um, increasing, artificially increasing um, heat and light. Um, and this meant that they could sell decorative flowers for more months of the year. The nuns at San Giovanni Evangelista across the city too also extended the growing season of, of these flowers, selling, according to contemporary accounts, so many violets, carnations, lilies, and other flowers that they earn a lot of money much of the year round. 
Many of these flowers grown in convent gardens and elsewhere were used for their scent as well as for their beauty. And this is particularly true of rose, orange flower and bean flower water. So I'm talking about um, orange flowers, not the oranges themselves and bean flowers rather than the beans themselves. Um, bean flowers, um, beans have been developed not to not for scent for the, the eating now. So it's really hard to get bean flower uh, water that's in any way authentic. But it probably, they probably smell similar to sweet peas to today. These waters were ubiquitous, which often had alcohol in them as well, were ubiquitous new to ingredients and then were distilled. You steep them, you steep these plants in water or in wine, and then you distill them. And distillation of, in this kind was particularly associated, as Tillman Tarkas has shown, with women. Um, and this is the, the what I'm showing you now is the front of two um, distillation handbooks, which clearly show women's uh, roles in distillation. Um, and they make these women who would distill um, waters made supplemented their income often from um, selling either to apothecaries or sometimes directly to uh, their neighbours. Um, there's certainly um, evidence from Italy that this happened, but it's a little bit sparse. Because these women are not the wealthy women in the Medici family, they're not um, accomplished women like Giovanna Gazzoni who get noticed. They're women who are living often in relatively poor situations who possibly wouldn't be able to um, write, learn, write or read. So this means that there's only elusive uh, basis of uh, transactions, um, but they do sometimes turn up in criminal or inquisition records. It's from these sources that we hear about women like Madeleine the Weaver on trial in Rome in 1613 for poisoning. Madeleine scraped out a living in various ways. I make waters for washing women's faces. I also make oils from herbs of all kinds, she says. Uh, but she also rented out rooms for sex workers and was well known for selling love magic. Um, and and these, these things tend to go together in the sources. The most startling example of women's friendship networks uh, shared, shared how women's friendship networks shared cosmetic recipes and preparations is in the notorious Aquatofana trial in Rome in the mid-17th century, where seven women were eventually executed for selling slow-acting poison to kill off um, about 40 men who were generally um, violent uh, husbands. Poison was circulated under the, under the pretense that it was an aqua bella, a beautifying water, or a liquid meant to remove blemishes from the complexion, or conversely, a liquid tooth polish. Fifteen correspondence to aristocratic women can sometimes give us clues as to this mainly lost, largely non-literate culture. In 1508, a woman named Anna Abrea, um, Jewish Anna, gave Katrina Sport to the Countess of Sporley, who may or may not be represented there, some samples of her cosmetics after a request from one of Sport's agent. And she describes in this letter how uh, basically a beauty regime, a beauty routine that, um, that sports should follow in order to get the most from her cosmetics, applying one ointment in the evening, leaving it on overnight, then washing it off with water, then, have, then, then applying a cleanser, um, and then putting on some white lotion, um, which might be something akin to a moisturiser, judging by the kinds of um, lotions that I've uh, been making. Um, as part of my research. This perhaps, this letter in this letter is perhaps the earliest record of an entire beauty routine, uh, consisting of an overnight treatment, cleansing, moisturizing, and then a facial primer. This is the only trace of Anna's life that's come down to us. The world that she existed in, the world of immigrant Rome, um, because um, there was a lot of um, Jewish immigrants in Rome due to the expulsion of Jews from mainland Spain in 1492, um, this world was described in a lively picaresque novel called Andalusian Lozana by another Spanish immigrant, Francisco de Licardo, and this book came out, uh, was published in 1528 in Venice. Uh, the action, however, takes place in Rome between 1513 and 27. Lozana was a converted Jewish woman who arrived in Rome without any husband or family to support her, so she was dependent on the charity of others. She soon finds herself in a household led by a woman from Naples and her children who made their living by, and I quote, concocting facial preparations with powders, rouges, and creams, plucking eyebrows, and beautifying betrothed women. 
whilst while they prepared treatments of rock candy lotions from the jujube tree and astringents for female parts. This combination of cosmetic treatments and herbal remedies for sexual health including probably a veiled reference to uh, herbs that would cure abortion, is typical of the early pamphlets of cosmetic remedies too. The first printed cosmetic recipe book was published in 1526. It would have been sold by street sellers for a few pennies, probably alongside cosmetic preparations, and it includes recipes for a wide variety of cosmetics, moisturizers, moisturizers anti-wrinkle preparations, hair dye, and so on alongside recipes to provoke menstruation or miscarriage to aid pregnancy and birth. Opening poem, which I'm showing you here alongside um, images of street sellers to get, kind of get you uh, in, kind of get you into the vibe, um, was probably designed, desi designed to be shouted aloud to attract customers. And this is my English translation. It's a, it's a rhyming translation in order to try and give you a sense of the um, the type of birth it is. So apologies if it's not as accurate as uh, uh, as otherwise it would be. So it says, ladies who wish to be fair, this book will fulfill your desire. In rosy and white is your prayer, a glow like the sun you'll acquire. These things won't seem modish or fate, but will give you a natural look. So many secrets to make, all these tips are be fit in this book. Farna and her friends did not only make recipes, but also attended to the physical needs of clients. And this is another illustration from Lotsana and Alicia, and I think it's a very important and interesting image. Um, Lotsana was a maestra. This is a term that's used interchangeably with other terms uh, for women who specialise in various aspects of maintaining and beautifying other women's bodies. Lotsana just included dressing hair, applying makeup for weddings, plucking eyebrows, removing body hair, and create, creating and applying bespoke skin treatments. She's a beautician and a hairdresser. In this illustration from the 1528 book, uh, Lotsana sits plucking the eyebrows of her customer, Tarina, who kneels between her legs. Tarina's hair hangs loose down her back, perhaps just washed, as she peers at Lotsana's progress in a hand mirror. Further female clients, Oriana and Aquileia amongst them, wait for their beauty treatments in the background, whilst one of Loxana's friends, a sex worker named Vivicia, sleeps with her customer in a curtained bed. Loxana's lover, Rampan, Rampin, is pictured twice, each time with a pestle and mortar, grinding ingredients for her beauty cures, or encouraging the roaring fire with bellows. Ride plants and straw-wrapped bottles, um, are hung from the ceiling, whilst jars and, and the fact that they're straw, straw wrapped indicates that they'd contain waters, waters, uh, distilled waters for catching straw and straw wrapped um, bottles to protect them from light. Um, whilst jars on the windowsill are most likely preparations being left steep in the sunshine. This is a very common instruction in uh, recipe books. Although fictional, of course. Um, it's likely that Delicado's book evokes the messy lives of countless women who lived in the poorer quarters of Renaissance cities. It suggests that the long wait for beauty treatments necessitated, offered opportunities for chat, uh, gossip, laughter, and sociability, just as the discussion of the medicinal properties of plants formed part of the conversation in Fonte's work of women, although from a different uh, social echelon. There's relatively little direct evidence about this type of cosmetic practice and hardly any written by the women themselves. The extent recipe texts become extremely important as historical sources. I've been working on these in various ways over the last five years or so, um, and mainly from uh, this book, Giovanni Marinello's Ornamenti delle Donne, which is a very um, widespread book and which has about 4,000 recipes, and I've just made a handful of them. Um, and they are, I do write the recipes in the back of my book if you want to make some yourself. But I have to say, when I started making these, I had no idea what I was doing. And, and the process of trying to make recipes from an original uh, Renaissance text is in itself a really interesting thing to do. So um, I would do that first and then you can look at, you know, I've got amounts and processes in there and then, then you can look at what you choose to. Take, for example, a simple recipe for scented body wash, here taken from Giovanni Marinella's Ornaments of Ladies. Um, again, it asks for equal parts of dried rose petals, lavender and sage, 
a large handful of sage leaves and the same amount of lavender and rose flowers boiled together effectively. When I first made it, it was clear that um, it maybe tasted changed, but um, the whole uh, um, water smelt to me very much like a roast dinner, um, which I didn't particularly want to smell like. Um, and so I tweaked the ingredients. I used much less sage than rosemary and lavender. And when I did that, I really liked it. Um, and so you just get it as a kind of earthy undertone to the scent. And once I've done that, it was really pleasant mild water to use as a rinse uh, for your face or for your hands. It did indeed, as promised in the text, console my spirit and put me in a good mood. Another recipe that works extremely well once you understand how to read in between the lines, this very short one for lip salve, make an ointment with rose oil and a little wax. <laughs> um, the assumed knowledge is really interesting here. Doesn't tell you how to make rose oil because making a scented oil would presumably have been a very obvious thing to know in the period as a way of capturing perfume from seasonal blooms. And it also didn't reveal respective amounts of wax oil. Again, because beeswax is such a common ingredient and used in the Renaissance household, used for all manner of topical medications and, and other uh, things as well. It was probably just left up to the maker to make it how they wanted. In fact, it was only with the help of my friend Anna, and it's Anna's kitchen that we were messing up on the um, table to the right-hand side. Anna is a, a very useful friend. She's a medical herbalist. And she helped me negotiate this sparse text and make actually a really lovely uh, rose lip style, really from the oil onwards, uh, which is very similar uh, to what's available commercially today in terms of texture, but maybe smells nicer than most lip styles. The recipe is a completely unexpected result. I had no idea before I tried it. Um, and this, again, I tried in somebody else's, made a mess in someone else's kitchen, my, my in-law's kitchen in rural Scotland. Boiling together mallow, psyllium and willow would make an impressively gooey gel. And that's what the film, I don't know if it's real, and if it'll work it. Um, much to my surprise, did actually work to smooth uh, the smooth um, split ends in hair. And I could not believe it when I um, when I boiled these together and it turned into this gel. It smells a bit like pond, but um, the gel it makes is really is quite impressive. Equally surprising. Um, was this, that the squishing together of ground figs, pine nuts, mustard and camphor oil would lead to a creamy lather that leaves the skin of the hands feeling soft. Um, and this is, this is a great one to try at home because it's very easy and it uh, um, impresses people because it actually lathers on your hand. It does look a bit awful though. Um, throughout this reconstruction journey, I've been constantly impressed with the realms of knowledge that these recipes reveal. Recent work by Erin Griffey um, on Renaissance cosmetic recipes, um, as, well, as well as my work, have shown again and again how much previously unsuspected knowledge is buried in these texts, creating useful products from easily available natural ingredients that can be tweaked to personal tastes and requirements. Daily domestic experimentation that's been completely lost to mass produced industrialization. Making these recipes in the context of a home kitchen can be seen as a counterpart to early modern women's cosmetic formulation continuing or reviving a tradition of domestic experimentation that was characteristic of the early modern period that created knowledge from the practices of everyday life, quote another amazing historian, Elaine Leon. So when we look at this luscious plate of fit today, painted by Giovanna Gazzoni, and here shown in her mid-60s in a sensitive portrait by Carlo Moratti, we could understand them not merely as delicious fruit to eat, also, there's having a multiplicity of hidden uses, powers placed there for the discerning and inquisitive mind to discover. Making some of these recipes in mine, friends and relatives kitchens hasn't just been fun, but has been revelatory, leading me on my own process of discovery. I see myself not looking down on these women from my lofty historical perch, but experimenting alongside them, experiencing the same wonder and frustration, the same engagement with sticky, juicy, gooey, and sometimes recalcitrant ingredients from the natural world. Following these recipes not only has the potential to reveal qualities of the material and sensory world of early modern women, how they smelt, what their ointments or waters felt like on the skin, but also allows us to recapture their skills as expert practitioners and to assert that these overlooked women as bearers and transmitters of knowledge. 
women like Vatsani, also the many unnamed, unrecorded makers whose work stand behind the printed recipes, should and are increasingly finding uh, their place in the histories of both art and science. Thank you. I'll just unshare my screen. And thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate uh, the uh, truly multimedia, multi-sensory uh, invitation to engage with history that you've uh, brought to us today um, in the uh, sources that you're examining alone. Uh, we saw a lot of different kinds of media uh, in addition to your experimentation. Um, I certainly have questions, but I'm going to open it up to the audience first. And give folks a minute to type things in. Oh, one has come right up. Um, all right, Evelina, um, thanks you very much for this fascinating talk, um, Dr. Burke. Uh, do we see any examples of plants or recipes that Giovanna incorporated from the Americas or other parts of the world? Yes. Um, I'm trying to think of by Giovanna Gazzoni and nothing comes to mind immediately, but that might be difficult because nothing's come to my mind. But yes, generally um, in the 16th uh, century, um, and 17th centuries, people are very, very excited by new world plants. Um, and as I'm sure you'll appreciate, this is a very troubled history, um, given that people um, see these new lands as places to exploit. And they see the knowledge of the people who live there as also something to exploit. And so they are using um, the knowledge of indigenous people to try and find plants that will replace expensive ingredients um, that have to be imported into Europe. So, for example, they try and hunt um, a mastic, which is a plant that's only grown in the island of Chios. It's very frequent in the nascent um, cosmetics and medicines. And they have a search for Peruvian mastic, for example, in Peru, and trying to find these plants that will replace things. They're very keen on uh, a plant called guayacum. I think it's this um, cure-all and it will treat um, diseases like syphilis. Um, and so um, throughout these books, and this is something that we're going to do more work on. I'm working on a project right now um, that, fingers crossed, that hopefully will digitize these recipes and so we can understand where these, how these recipes relate to broader questions of colonialism. Um, and so you can literally see how some European um, were affected by this whole this new world that was opening up um, and were affected also by the kind of relationship of exploitation with indigenous people and, and the land um, that they husbanded. Great, thank you. Oh, yes, that's something. We've, that. <laughs> no, no, we've been talking about it. Evelina thanks you, as do I. And, you know, it's related to conversations that we've been having in the galleries of the McEwen show and thinking about the genesis of the field of botany and botanical illustration uh, that uh, uh, is certainly about. Um, and uh, acquisitiveness of the colonial project for the plants, but also the knowledge about the plants, Absolutely. which yeah. we also see in the scholarship of our colleague in women's and gender studies here at Wellesley, um, Banu Subramaniam. Mm -hmm. um, There's been some really wonderful work on this um, in the last um, 10 or 20 years um, by people who you know, specialize on, in, in, in colonialism. But certainly, you know, I'm, I specialize in, in Renaissance and Rock Italy. Well, but it's so relevant there, for your work there, too. You can see right, but you're pointing to this women's yeah. knowledge as well. Yeah. And and interestingly, the women, you know, the, the this emphasis on lost knowledge and how this kind of gets incorporated into males on often male dominated upper, you know, elite text. Is really interesting. So a lot of that work that's being done by scholars of colonialism is very interesting to me because of the worthlessness of a lot of the women I study. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, the women couldn't read and write. They, they only appear in criminal records of her. And so a, a lot of the stuff I've been trying to do is indebted to the work of these scholars and the way that they 
have to think through um, alternative ways to approach history. Absolutely. It's about method. And, and that's part of what's so exciting and inventive about your research are the various sources that you're looking for. But I, I'm glad you brought that up. And that's really important for our students to hear. It's partly out of necessity that you're being inventive with your method, because this these are the ways you can access the women who are your subjects. Absolutely. Karen, uh, what was public perception of cosmetics? Ooh, this is a good one. And how did that change over time? Was it also related to class? Uh, that's an easy question. Uh, but, uh, might also be a long one as well. Well, um, it does change over time. Um, and cosmetics, the history of cosmetics has a tendency for people to make kind of really untested assumptions about it. So they say, oh, women are always interested in beauty. They're always, oh, from a time of memorial. And, you know, and the relationship between cosmetics, beautification, gender absolutely changes depending on the society you're in and the changes within the society and the kind of social group that you're in within that. So it does have, uh, it's related to class. Um, what happens in the 16th century is that um, cosmetics becomes much more popular and talked about in Italy. So you start to get a lot of um, um, manuscript and printed books, a manuscript book of just cosmetics, not of health, because cosmetics used to be kind of put in with other health regimes, but you get just kind of beauty books aimed at brides. So there's a really wonderful one in the Walters Museum in Baltimore. Um, and you get these um, given to brides um, from about the 1480s, 1490s. And then when printing comes in, this seems to be spread to a much broader pool of women with these very cheap recipe books. Um, and then there's people like Gerani Marinello come along in the 1560s um, out of a medical tradition because cosmetics starts to be taught at the University of Padua Medical School in, yes, in 1550 by Gabriel so Palacio. And yeah, they teach they teach all sorts of skin care. They, 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 he writes a book called On Ornamentation um, and, he, and these doctors try and make a division between what we'd call color cosmetics, so lipstick, mascara, foundation, that kind of stuff, which I think is terrible, and skincare and hair care, which they say is all right, but it's for doctors to know about, not for women. So there's this massive kind of land grab of all this um, information that was traditionally women's, you know, women's secrets. And like with midwifery, doctors try and take that over. They also, doctors are very trying to take over everything over basically in the 16th century. Uh, they also try and take um, over um, what uh, the, the tradition of cosmetics uh, recipes. And um, this is this is the major change in the 15, uh, 50s and 60s um, and beyond. And this has a massive effect on the way that cosmetics are understood across Europe because so many doctors are trained in Padua Medical School across Europe. It becomes a part of the tradition's concern. And beyond that, people, especially with the Counter Reformation, some people argue that women, it's women's duties to look as the best for their husband. Married women should do this because otherwise, otherwise their husbands might commit adultery and it would be the woman's fault, obviously. Um, and um, some, uh, and some um, people say that women just shouldn't care about their looks at all. Um, and but there's a, a couple of um, female writers, most Moderata Fonte and Lucrezia Marinella. He was Giovanni Marinella's daughter, and they both argue quite openly. They say, you know, what's it got to do with men? Whether we can make fun our faces or not, um, it's nothing to do with them. It doesn't harm anybody. Just leave us to our ornamentation. So there's a lot of debates going over the century. And yes, it was related to class in that um, in that it's associated with prostitution um, in some um, areas, particularly in the Counter-Reformation when people get particularly angry um, about cosmetics and they say that poor women particularly spend all their money on cosmetics and that's one of the reasons why um, they condemn it. Fascinating, thank you. So you started to answer the next question, which is one from one of our student employees. Uh, and we looked at um, work by a lot of different artists today already from you uh, and uh, your discussion of how cosmetics moved to medical teaching. Um, it also makes me think of our interaction with 
cosmetic procedures like today, though sometimes it's split between yeah. you know, um, like um, even how well, we shop in pharmacies, health and beauty, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Much less what we go to dermatologists or like cosmetic surgeons or like uh, else for. Um, but can you speak more yeah. about how this topic can tell us? about the intersections of art and science uh, during this period? Well, uh, so this kind of division between art and science isn't, isn't established in quite the same way. So you wouldn't have the word science. Um, you're only just starting to have the word art uh, used in the way that we might use it. But what's the real connection is observation. So you see that really close observation of plants, that really close observation of nature, that willingness to experiment with things means that um, artists are often important in terms of both illustrating science, but also this kind of close and slow looking. Um, so that would be one of the many ways that were really important way in which art and science are connected. Um, also, I mean, I suppose it depends how you um, how you define science, but cosmetics and art are both very much part of what is now called the scientific revolution. Um, you know, um, that Sony knew um, Galileo, who was also patronized in the Medici court. The Medici court was an ex in the in the early seventeenth century was a very court that was very interested in experimentation. So some of the Medici family, the, there's a, a, a one of the um, Medici men called um, Don Antonio de Medici has actually wrote two books of cosmetics, um, which he experimented with in the um, their court their, their court apothecary their court um, uh, distillation room. So so there was uh, definitely I don't think people would have made even that separation between art and science at the time. They just thought it was a pursuit of knowledge in various different ways. It was also work. I want to get back to your experiments, uh, which, uh, you know, we, you depict, you know, our, these historical figures like experimenting and their knowledge, and then you replicate what they were doing, which uh, like really part of what it conveyed to me was how hard it was. Uh, that you had to know a lot, but it's also work to prepare these recipes. Uh, can you d discuss the labor of m making food, medicine, and cosmetics that yeah. you're telling us about? I mean, what was interesting is that there's this uh, kind of popular perception of Renaissance women's cosmetics as being things that are poisonous and that are uh, smelly and uh, you know and, and that's stu that stupid really that oh you know these resonates as well they put anything on their faces but actually when you try and make the recipe the opposite thing comes out you're like wow I know less much less than these women did because I started with these recipes and I often had no clue and it was really helpful having my um, friend Anna the herbalist um, just saying oh let's just give it a go she had the confidence to do it some of the recipes, like there's a recipe for anti-wrinkle cream, um, which is made with um, tallow, and and uh, some and that's really hard to make if you're just going to make it by hand. Yeah, it I'd say. A lot I mean, that does with, sound moisturizing. It doesn't sound it, particularly well scented, though. When I give a talk, I come along and I bring these things, and people can try them. So next, next, next one, one time I'll come to I'll come to see you, and I'll bring some uh, cosmetics. Um, it's 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 scented. It's actually all right, but it involves a massive amount of whisking, and to the extent that I always give up and I just use a blender. But <laughs> um, it's which is really terrible. But it's really it makes makes you think about the strength of people's arms, um, the expected just the physical labour that people are doing all the time. So it would seem to presumably as much work to someone who was doing this in the 16th century. And I assume that a lot of the time this was working women, this was maids and servants who were making this kind of stuff. Um, also, the sense that it's a real sense of loss as well, actually, in some of the recipes. You know, that we don't, we see roses, right, and we appreciate them, aren't they beautiful? And then we move on, we don't do anything with them. With all these, you know, even in my own garden, my own experience, I thought, well, why don't I get purple and make rose oil and then make lip balm out of my own scented roses? Wouldn't that be a lovely thing to do? But I suppose, um, you know, we're so in the we're so used to just buying things easier, it's quicker. 
Um, but there is something that felt to me like I need to learn from these practices. And anything in particular you would emphasize for us and especially Wellesley students as, as something to learn and take away? Well, I think the students, I, I say this to my students, um, and I'm not sure the answer. I would say, you know, think about whether history always has to be written down. Um, and whether, if history always has to be written down, who we're excluding from that history. Um, I think it's, it is, um, there's a new um, interest in reconstruction, in historical reconstruction in many different projects, such as, you know, the Making a Known project um, by Pam, led by Pamela Smith at Columbia University. It's a great project. Um, and that's dealing with artifact culture, and that tends to be a bit of culture. But, but there's, it's really interesting also to think about um, making amongst people who don't write so much. And, and does history need to be written? How can we experience it? And how can we write about it? But our history students who are used to writing about um, things that are nonverbal, like paintings, it can be actually easier than for history students who haven't done much work on, on art history on art or, or non-verbal um, sources. So that's what I would ask. Think about how history, how we can experience history and think about our relationship with nature and how central that still is to our lives. Now, somehow it's much more hidden um, than it was in the 16th and 17th century. And think about what we can learn um, from the way that um, these men and women and particularly women, um, use nature to improve their lives. This calls to mind uh, some of the sources that you use, which are are unconventional for art historians, uh, the the herbarium, the actual historic plants. Uh, can you talk about uh, talk more about so because you know so you were looking at a variety of different kinds of visual culture media some more conventional than others, but in addition to these live plants that you turned into tinctures and such, um, I, I really appreciated hearing about um, this archive of plants uh, that you've also spent time with. Can you discuss that more? Well, there's several um, herbaria uh, in Italy. Um, there's Bulusa Avandis is probably the most famous and it's easily accessible because they've now put it all online. So you can search for any plant and you can see it uh, in this herbarium. I had a student actually, he did a PhD um, on another herbaria, um, the Carada Chibos herbarium. He's the person who made the really astonishingly beautiful herbals um, that I showed in the talk. Um, and his herbaria is again, very interesting. Um, it would be great if they could do more work on that. In, in Azurabandis, they've looked at the plants and tried to understand from that and from a 19th century um, plant collection, just how climate has changed in Italy uh, around um, Bologna um, in the subsequent 500 years. So there's a lot of different ways that you can use these, um, source it, these, these collections. Um, my student um, was interested in reconstruction and she um, um, made plants, um, made dried and pressed flowers um, to mimic um, Chibo's collection of dried flowers and found that they're very um, fashioned, they're really thought through in terms of what they look like and of course they've lost a lot of colour so they're not pretty as they used to be and she uh, linked quite a lot of them with their illustrations. And she also made, Chibo also made pigment and um, paint from, from other, some of the plants he connected. And so that's some, something else I do um, teach my students is about making um, paint and things like Dyer's broom and, and, and things like that. Um, really, it's this kind of interaction with nature and this interaction with doing things is a really interesting facet of, 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 of the way you can use these collections. But I think just more coming into coming into contact with plants that were growing 500 years ago um, is something that's very astonishing and exciting uh, for a historian. Um, and it's very difficult to explain exactly why. 
Uh, there's something there's something not entirely intellectually kind of valid about that. But it's just something about you know the touch and the experience of it. It's very that I'm kind of moving. Right, you're really pointing us toward embodied research. Right? You Absolutely. know, you're like there's a lot of reading and looking uh, in your research, as we see in our art historical research, which is itself something we do within our bodies, of course. But uh, the the incorporation um, of touch of uh, of um, engaging with materials in other ways, I think uh, it does expand um, our opportunities for imagining the past, uh, yeah. which is what history asks of us. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I really hope so. I feel that I'm thinking through all these issues very much, you know, this is this is like, I, I, I certainly haven't got any conclusions about this. I'm, you know, like, it's like trying out the recipes, you know, I'm just trying them out, I'm just seeing what comes up with and and that's I'm I mean I'm lucky to lucky enough to be in a space where I can do that where I'm supported to have this kind of like rather experimental sometimes sometimes a little bit um for some people a little bit strange we came through uh, of things and how we relate to the past how we um relate to that um, amazing um and complicated inheritance of European um culture um and not always a good inheritance. Um, which is increasingly, I think, what we need to recognise in the way that we study uh, European art and culture. That there's, for some people, it was terrible. You know, some people it's a really, it's a really terrible legacy. So um, it's, it's those kind of questions about how to think about a kind of really quite a different type of history uh, that have, have prompted these investigations. And I, yeah, really recommend anyone to just give it, just just to think, think things, have thought experiments and. And work with their senses more and see what comes up really that was that's really what i've been doing wonderful well thank you so much i know that we've all learned a great deal from you today uh and really appreciate um yeah imagining our, our relationships to plants uh and human relationships to plants over the history uh from different perspectives um and it, i think it's quite inspiring for all of us as well to go and tr try some recipes whether from the italian oh. renaissance or some or an, another place and time period yeah anytime place and time recipes are great <laughs> All right. Thanks to everyone uh, who's attended. Uh, special thanks again to uh, Sabrina and to Juning and to all of you who have tuned uh, in today. Uh, we will be uh, sharing this on YouTube as well, and we appreciate all of those uh, viewers as well. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.